Hello, Jamie. Hello. Uh, my name is Con Carroll. This is another edition of Pros and Con on uh, Blogging Heads, and I am with Jamie of the American Prospect. How about you go ahead and fully introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm an assistant web editor at the American Prospect. Great. Uh, so you're a contributing online editor. What's your exact role with the uh, with Tapped? I'm an assistant web editor. So I do I do the balance sheet, do some work for Vox Pop, uh, social media, kind of jack of all trades in that sense. Gotcha. Okay. Well, our first topic of the day is uh, the payroll tax deal, which uh, is still not. Um, 100% agreed upon and hasn't been voted on in either house, mm -hmm. but uh, pretty much all the big papers, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, had the outlines of a deal um, in the in their pages today, and it looks like it's going to get done, which um, <coughs> is something I predicted last week. Uh, what? How is it, how is the deal being played out um, on the left? What, what do you think of the deal? Yeah, I would say that uh, people were definitely surprised that it uh, resolve itself this quickly. Um, even a week ago, people thought that this was going to kind of replay with December, but uh, we def definitely are glad that it <laughs> is resolving so quickly. Um, and even that the even at the beginning of the week, there was the sense that even though the payroll was decided upon, everyone wanted to get that over with quickly without even offsets. Um, that the unemployment insurance and the doc fix would take a lot longer, but I think it was just announced today that everything is looking to go up for a vote at the end of the week, so I, it was definitely surprising to see how fast everything was resolved. But on the other hand, too, there's, like you said, nothing is settled completely with the other two problems, and I know there's lots of waffling going on right now with how to pay for these things. Right. Um, you know, I uh, tweeted out last night when I first started hearing about the deal that it looked like a big win for the Republicans, and I, I wrote a, a larger kind of piece on it today. Because, um, you know, essentially what you have here is a tax cut that isn't paid for, which is what conservatives generally want. Um, the Bush tax cuts weren't paid for. The uh, when, they, when they come up again at the end of uh, this year, at the end of 2012, the, Republican is going to, the Republicans are going to be arguing that they uh, shouldn't be paid for again. So we have, again, the precedent that tax cuts aren't paid for. Uh, but then on the spending side, you have both the uh, doc fix paid for and the unemployment compensation both paid for, but through spending cuts. Um, and, you know, at the very start of this debate, uh, Democrats wanted to fund all of this through tax hikes on the rich. Uh, but that none of that is happening. There are there are no tax hikes in this deal. So you know, I think when you look at the, the overall picture, you have um, tax cuts for all Americans, even the very wealthy Americans. You know, even uh, millionaires who are um, you know uh, in the hated one percent are getting this this payroll tax cut. Um, so we have you have a tax cut for everyone, which isn't paid for, and then you have uh, a bunch of uh, spending items which are paid for through other spending cuts. So uh, I think this, this is a huge win for Republicans, and I was, I was surprised to see as many um, liberals and Democrats uh, touting it um, as I did yesterday. Well, I think uh, liberals and Democrats also see it as a win for how it showed that Republicans really realized that they did not end up looking very good at the end of December at the, the payroll fight, and how if they wanted to have any chance in November that they really needed to fall back into line and support the payroll tax cut in a quicker fashion and kind of get it out of the way. And I remember reading in the Wall Street Journal there was a quote from someone in the House who said, we agreed to this just because we want to get it out of the way, and that's why the unemployment insurance and the doc fix have been the big issues of this fight instead of the payroll tax, which got them a lot of grief in December. Um, and I know that with the doc fix especially, uh, that was one of, the, with the SGR, that was one of Obama's big things at the end of the fall, and the fact that that seems to be progressing um, in a good fashion. The Obama administration sees that as a very good thing, too. So I, I kind of think it's more of a 
evening the scales or both sides can tout it as a win from different angles, I guess. Um, but I, I think liberals are very happy with the fact that this is going through too because of the economic crisis and no legislator wants to not pass a tax cut in the current condition, which is why December made Congress not look any good and why they're doing so bad with their approval ratings right now. No, and there, there are analysts who say that um, that the Democrats won on this fight. Uh, I, uh, In response to my blog post this morning, the editor of uh, Business Insider, the stalwart, said uh, my analysis was shaky. Um, and so I, I asked him why, and, and basically he said that this bill gives Obama the stimulus that he, that he wants all the way through Election Day. Um, but I think what you have is a lot of conservatives uh, who, who honestly believe that, you know, uh, Keynesian temporary stimulus along these lines of $100 billion really isn't going to do anything for the economy. Um, well, and had, another, um, and too, I think another reason this looks good for Obama is that so many times in the past year he's tried to use the bully pulpit to get things. So when he goes in front of Congress and says, you need to pass the payroll tax as soon as quick, as soon as you possibly can this February, and it happens, he can kind of take credit for it, even though the way that the presidency and the Congress works, um, he doesn't really have that much to do with it. I think uh, Andrew Spross wrote something about this earlier in the week. So as a framing device, this looks very good for Obama, too. What Are you at all worried about um, 2013 and, uh, let's say, Obama uh, does win re-election and the economy is still... Um, pretty much as it is now, let's say, you know, adding just enough jobs to tread water uh, unemployment-wise. Uh, GDP growth is, you know, stuck in the twos, so not very impressive, so kind of just, you know, treading water, not really growing. Uh, do you think Obama's going to have to uh, push for another extension of this payroll cut? And it, I guess my larger question is, is there any worry on, worry on the left that this turns into a permanent um, payroll tax cut? Um, the way I look at the February fight is not even being who won this time, but really this is getting extended until the end of 2012, and there's going to be another fight come next December after the election, no matter who gets elected. Um, and I can envision the same battle happening that happened in December, next December, and that's the real thing to kind of ponder out is what's going to happen next time. And I'm not sure because what's going to happen because we're still unsure of what's going to happen with the economy for the rest of the year. Signs look good for now, but with the Euro crisis and other things that we can't really... Well, I, I guess that's my question. I guess that's my for. question is, yeah. is who's going to be pushing on what side there? It, are we going to have an exact replay where you have the Democrats and Obama saying, you know, the European... Uh, your uh, economy is shaky. It looks like the world's about to teeter into a recession. The U.S. is the only econo um, engine of economic growth. Therefore, we need to extend this tax cut another year, in which case, you know, it would be three years that we've done this uh, uh, payroll tax extension. It starts looking less temporary and more, and more permanent. Yeah, I think it's hard to game that out now. I don't think it would pose a political problem if it did get extended for another year. Um, simply because of the economic circumstances and you're going to have to give the policies that the economy requires. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure I even want to game it out that far because there's so many variables you can't predict for. But even, even if the scenario you see happens, does happen and they need to extend it again, I don't see it being a political problem just yet. Well, looking even further ahead, we are in the middle of uh, Budget Week on Capitol Hill. Uh, Obama released his budget on Monday, and uh, we've been having the hearings all week. This new uh, Jeffrey Zients guy has been on the Hill testifying. Uh, what I haven't, you know, I haven't seen a ton of uh, positive uh, liberal reaction to the budget. What would you say is uh, uh, your feeling, is the American prospects feeling on, on Obama's budget? Is this something you guys are proud of? I think the what you have a lot of liberals saying is it's not quite enough. Um, we need more m military cuts. We need to do more to stimulate jobs. 
just it's it's a matter of scope um, rather than uh, missing the boat on what to prioritize. Uh, we need more infrastructure. Um, but as a political document showing what the Obama administration is looking to achieve, not only for the rest of this term, for, but for if he gets reelected, it it's what he's trying to show support for are things that I think liberals show support for. And there was one thing uh, Center for American Progress had a piece where it basically said it's a flawed document, but with what we have to work with, it's pretty good. So, um, so the the flaws that I'm hearing is that it, it doesn't cut uh, defense uh, enough because the the cuts that are already in there are the include the cuts from the Budget Control Act, which is what it's it's close to a, a trillion dollars worth of defense cuts over the over the next ten years. You, you're thinking there's uh, you're hearing that there's want for more, even more defense cuts on top of that. There there are from from some places. But personally, I think that it kind of because what you have with the budget, it's it's not it's never a realistic uh, picture of what's going to happen politically because the president gives it to Congress and hardly any of it gets passed, especially now with the Congress that and the presidency, the forces we have dealing with there. Um, so, as a political document, I think it was. It was the one that you could imagine Obama giving, and it was very similar to the one he's posed for the past few years in his administration. So there, there's the quibbles of with scope, but politically, I think it does the job that it needs to do, trying priority, priorities, gearing up for the election campaign. Did you watch any of the uh, hearings today on Capitol Hill? I didn't get a chance to, no. Um, there is a, a great moment in the House Budget Committee hearing. Uh, Scott Garrett was questioning... Uh, Jeffrey Zients, and uh, who is uh, Obama's uh, OMB guy, and Zients was going on about how the Obama budget doesn't raise taxes on anybody who makes under two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. And so Garrett, you know, followed up. Uh, you know, does that mean that um, the uh, penalty for the individual mandates, which would apply to everyone, including to people who make less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, does that mean that those aren't a tax? And uh, Zeitz walked right into it. He said, yes, those aren't taxes, um, which, of course, uh, majorly undermines uh, the, uh, the Obama administration's argument in front of the Supreme Court to defend Obamacare, because one of the, their main arguments is that uh, the individual mandate is justified um, under the Constitution as under the Congress's taxing power. And here you have Obama's uh, uh, head budget guy, his, his guy in charge of OMB, saying that, no, in fact, uh, it's not a tax. Um, so you had a, a pretty big fumble there that will make the defense of Obamacare in, uh, in, in court that much harder for the Obama administration. I, I didn't get a chance to see that. I'm sure that he had a lot of things on his mind when he was doing that. But going back to taxes, I think that was another part that I didn't touch on that is going to be a, a very crucial part of how the Obama budget is perceived and what gets passed and not. And one of the big things for it that I think is going to be a big part of the fight um, for the budget is the Buffett Rule, which is one of the big ways that the budget seeks to lower the deficit. Is it? How, I don't think they put anywhere in there how much it actually raises. Do you know how much money it actually raises or what the mechanism is? I, I, um, I did see... I did read somewhere. I, it, it's in the trillions... Um, well, I would highly doubt that because the, the total amount. It, yeah, I, the total. The total I think amount. Had a, he raises taxes. He's saying that it would reduce the deficit by 1.5 trillion over the next 10 years. The Buffett rule. Yes. Okay, I would. I would. Uh, you have to. And the and the repeal of the Bush tax cuts. Oh. Those two things together. Well. <laughs> yes. Well, that that that's a lot. I mean. Uh, the total tax reduction in the in, in the in the Obama's budget is 1.9 trillion of, of, of tax yes. hikes. So to say that um, repealing the Bush tax cuts in the Buffett rule is worth 1.5 trillion, um, the Buffett rule could be you know uh, 100 billion dollars of that, or even a billion dollars of that. Uh, yeah, you'll you'll have to provide that link because I don't I I've been looking for it and I haven't seen any line item that shows uh, the administration predicting uh, what their buffer will uh, would would raise um, 
No, I, I, I haven't found anything that says, um, says it by itself, but I think the Buffett rule, not only it is a major tenet of how Obama seeks to balance job growth with controlling the deficit, um, going back to the budget being a political no, document I for um, the president, it, it sets up his election. Uh, no, I, I agree. It's, it's right. all about firing up his base. And uh, what mm -hmm. I, I wrote an article called Revenge Onomics, and I talked about how the Buffett rule was all about sticking it to the rich. Um, but that has everything to do with just vengeance and making liberals feel good. It has nothing to do with economic growth. Uh, there's, there's, there's no way the Buffett rule helps anyone get a job. All it does is punish people that liberals don't like. Um, and, and On the, the other the, hand, the though, foundation. they've done many studies with businesses, small businesses and corporations, and tax, tax rates have no impact on whether businesses decide to hire people. Uh, okay. Um, even if that was true, uh, let, let's stipulate for just for now that it is, it still doesn't do anything to create jobs, right? This, is, this has nothing to do with economic growth. It has everything to do with just punishing people that Obama and the liberal base doesn't like. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go back to it, but I, I, the only study that I've seen on what the Buffett rule would actually raise uh, would be about $40 billion, uh, which, is, which is nothing when you're looking at um, a $1.3 trillion deficit, which we have. Um, I mean, I, it's, a great, it's a great rhetorical tool. He's definitely going to, to you know, um, campaign on it. But um, we'll see. I'll be very interested to see how, what the line item on, on what the uh, Buffett rule actually raised, because I, I haven't seen it yet. No, I, I haven't seen that one by itself. But even beyond being rhetorical, I think there, there's a, definitely a desire from many people, not only in Obama's base, but from the general public, the, the not, not the people getting these tax breaks, that there's a certain amount of unfairness that people can make so much more money than them and not be taxed at the same rate. And I think there's virtue in having people pay the same tax rates, regardless of whether it provides job growth. But right, right. Well, I, mean, I think there, the, there's just a um, huge confusion out there among people about how much of the taxes the rich already do pay, right? I mean, the United States already has the most progressive tax system in the world. Uh, you know, this is a fact that Jonathan Chait ran into like a buzzsaw this week. And, this past week, he tried to call Veronica Derugri out um, for claiming that, and uh, you know was, was very you know mean and hostile about it. And um, Clive Crook at the Atlantic, who's who's no conservative, came in and wrote a post saying, you know, I'm sorry, Jonathan, but you're just wrong. The United States does have uh, one of the most progressive progressive tax systems in the world already. Uh, I mean, we can you know uh, debate about how much more you want to make it progressive, but uh, most people don't realize, uh, A, that the rich already pay you know, far greater share of taxes, and that they already pay a higher percentage of taxes than they make in income. Um, you know, there, there's just, you know, there's no, there's no uh, principle behind the, the fairness charge, right? I mean, there's no reason to say that, you know, uh, let's say the top I don't know the CBO numbers in front of me, but let's say the top um, one percent already pays, uh, you know, twenty nine percent of the taxes, and they make somewhere around twenty five percent of the income. You know, why would thirty percent or thirty one percent be more fair than than twenty nine percent? You know, there's no logic behind any of those numbers. It's all about just you know hurting the rich because people like to hurt the rich. I, I don't see it along those lines at all, because in the economic mess we're in right now. Income equality is one of the big things that's happening, and you can debate whether you think that that's a problem, but the truth is that there are rich people who are making far more than other people, and it's not about punishing them or giving money to the poor, but it's the fact that there's the gulf between them. And I think that there's politicians who are trying to seek well, let me, let remedies me ask, for this gap. Let me ask you this. You know, you talked about income inequality. Do you think uh, the Buffett rule or taxing the rich will solve income inequality? Do you think if we... No, it requires a much larger thing of rules, but I think it provides a good start in framing the situation and so, trying to... So it doesn't reduce the deficit. It doesn't, um, you know, help economic growth. It doesn't combat any income inequality. 
The only thing I see that it really does is it makes liberal, liberals happy because it, it uh, sticks it to the rich guys. I, I don't see it along those lines of sticking it to the rich what, guys. What, is it, what does it concretely do? I think it's, it raises tax money from not the... If you look at the tax plans for the GOP uh, members, it reduces taxes on the rich and while increasing them heavily on the other 99% of the electorate or the public. So, so it takes money from rich people? That, that, that's its main, that's the only reason you like what, what it. Are you, what are you referring to? The buffer rule. It, it's not taking money from rich, it's creating a tax, uh, tax reform that taxes people at this equal rates. Well, no, not equal rates because... Or fair rates. What, what do you mean by fair? The rich already pay higher effective rates than everyone else. Because not people don't pay the same rates now. Uh, the rich pay a far high, the rich pay a far higher effective rate than everyone else does. Uh, but the tax breaks with, for example, the ones that Mitt Romney has, mm -hmm. uh, th those are loopholes that should not exist. Well, the, I, yeah, the, that, that's a different issue than you know letting the Bush tax cuts aside or uh, the buffer rule, which apply to everyone um, and, and not just people uh, who benefit from carried interest or or, or, or dividends. Um, you're not you're not going to be able to you know solve the address the income inequality um, by raising taxes. I mean, just look at like um, uh, I mean, if you look at the case of like um, hypothetical case where you have someone who makes you know 200 times what another person makes a year. Now you'd say, oh well, we must definitely tax that the person who makes 200 times the other person uh, in order for fairness, tax him at a higher rate. But you know, what if I then followed up with that and told you that the person who made 200 times the other person, um, the, the poor person, uh, that the rich person in that case was Mark Zuckerberg and the poor person in that case was Mitt Romney? You know, do we really need to uh, be taxing uh, Zuckerberg at, high, at much, much higher rates than Mitt Romney for any legitimate reason? No. Uh, I think you know, the, the better position uh, is for tax simplicity. Um, which is the opposite of what the buffer rule does. Buffer rule um, is the opposite of tax simplicity. What we need is a uh, flat, uh, flatter system, uh, lower rates, flatter code, and, and less loopholes. But everything about the Obama tax agenda um, moves us in the opposite direction. It's uh, you know more loopholes for for green energy companies and and higher rates. But the the problem with the flat tax is you have the opposite occurring where. It's not an implicit punishing of the poor, but what happens when you give these tax rates is you end up having the people who are not making millions of dollars pay a far larger share. No, I, I didn't, I didn't say a flat tax completely. I said flatter tax. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at look at Reagan's reform, right? Uh, Reagan's reform in 1986 went from God when he came in office. I think uh, there were 13 um, different. Uh, Tax levels and and you know thousands and thousands of pages of code, and he flattened it down to uh, you know just two brackets. Um, that's exactly the type of reform that we need. But you know Obama's moving in the opposite direction. If if you think that uh, we need a flatter tax and not to raise taxes on the rich, uh, how do you think the best way to get rid of the fix the deficit is? I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Ryan plan myself. I think you know when you look at uh, What's exploding in this country, um, or you know, why what's driving the deficits? It's not uh, taxes; it's it's spending. Um, you know, if you look at the uh, 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 revenue as a percentage of GDP, so taxes as a percentage of GDP, historically it's about eighteen percent, um, and now it's down about fifteen. And by the way, one of the huge reasons why it's down so much, why it's down to fifteen percent, is because we have such a progressive tax system. If we had a system that was less progressive, you wouldn't get such a huge drop off in the um, taxes as a percent of GDP. This is exactly why California always finds itself in such a huge hole in recessions, is that when you have a flatter tax, or a flatter tax system where people uh, pay, more even, pay more even rates, a big recession doesn't cause such a huge hole. Um, but if you look at once the economy recovers and once um, the upper income brackets start making more, uh, even without Obama's tax hikes, if you keep them at the same rates they are now, taxes as a percent of GDP are going to rise 
um, above their 18 percent uh, historical average. The problem is, is that even though taxes, without raising the rates, even though taxes as a percentage of GDP are going to rise to their historical uh, normal, uh, normal level, uh, spending as a percentage of GDP is going to go through the roof because you have the baby boomer t baby, baby boomers retiring and they are going to need Social Security and Medicare and a whole bunch of entitlements that are on autopilot and are going to send spending at percentage of GDP up around 24 uh, percent. Uh, I think um, TPM did, made a graph, I think it was today, that showed the relative differences and how the Obama budget and the Ryan plan would cut the uh, deficit. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, it would get down to $400 billion with the Ryan plan, I believe, and $600 billion with the Obama plan. And when, when you chart them out, the, the trend for these two things are not that different um, for where they would go 10 years from now. And I think that the Obama plan is, has a much better chance of, it has, does a better job of combining, keeping the stimulus going, which we still need. We're not out of this yet. There's still the opportunity for the euro crisis to have to get far worse and give us much more problems. Um, combining that with getting rid of the deficit, and I, liberal, I think many people on the left would say the top priority still needs to be working with stimulus, fixing infrastructure, working on education, rather than working on the deficit at this point. Yes, I saw that TPM chart as well, but you know the the mix of taxes and revenue is obscured in that chart. Like that that chart was just a, ta uh, a chart of um, debt as a percent of GDP. Uh, the, the Ryan budget, ha of course, has spending as a percentage of GDP down a lot further, um, as as well as revenues. So basically, he'd have um, the private sector um, people being able to freely spend and uh, choose to make their own decisions. And, and that being a much greater uh, percentage of, of the economy than Obama, which would have the government uh, taking a lot more money and spending a lot more money and having uh, bureaucrats in Washington make a lot more economic decisions. Um, so, yeah, when you just look at the total deficit reduction number side by side, the Ryan budget is only marginally better than Obama's budget. But when you look at you know the amount of money and the amount of decisions that Ryan allows uh, people to, to keep for themselves, uh, the uh, the Ryan budget, uh, is, you know, has a lot more freedom in it than Obama's does. Well, <laughs> basically, it comes down to a fundamental difference on how we both perceive things. Uh, <laughs> but I think so. I do think. Wanna, do you want to move to the uh, Republican race? That sounds good. So, are you, as a liberal, just enjoying this to no end? <laughs> well, it definitely is amusing to watch. I'm. Definitely excited for the return of the debate next Tuesday. Um, it, it seems like it's been a dry spell for for that sort of thing. But yeah, it's it's been a very strange race. I remember I wrote this piece um, in October about the GOP tax plans, and with Santorum, I didn't even bother grading his tax plan because I thought that it he was still a joke candidate. And it seems amazing to me that the race has turned out the way it is and that he's actually leading the national polls. I, I'm i sure that there is hardly anyone who could have predicted that would happen. Right. I it's uh, I definitely predict, definitely didn't predict it would happen. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's it's more just a function of uh, I, I underestimated how much um, the Republican base, you know, really, really, really just didn't like Romney. And, and I think Romney's... Yeah, and um, with Romney, too, I think he's done a great job of running a horrible campaign and uh, <laughs> we didn't realize that how because Mitt Romney on the surface looks like he'd be a very good candidate he's like he's attractive he can speak well um, he's got he has his resume which he waves around frequently but when he's in grassroots situations when he has to give a speech and connect to people when he has meet and greets he, even debates until recently he doesn't excel as well in those formats, and I think that Santorum, on the GOP uh, spectrum, he kind of gets the, the most improved award for the GOP in that he's really become a very good uh, speaker. He's Even in the last couple of debates where uh, Newt and Romney were at the forefront, he gave really good showings, um, and at least in the past month or so, it's very easy to see why he's been doing so well. Yeah, I don't think he's necessarily most improved. I just think he's kind of more of the last 
you know, credible candidate, last credible candidate standing. Um, I mean, if, you know, if you go down the list, right, we have everybody else disqualified themselves first. Um, you had, you know, Michelle Bachman was out in front, um, but then she started talking about, um, um, you know, vaccines uh, causing, you know, uh, 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 mental problems, which of course is junk science, and so she disqualified herself. You had uh, Rick Perry, just who was a terrible debater, and his debate performances disqualified him. Then you had Herman Cain and his personal life disqualifying him. Uh, you had uh, Newt Gingrich, who is just all over the map, and um, you know just his his narcissism, let's say, disqualified him. Um, and you know you you keep ticking those people off one by one, and all of a sudden. Uh, Rick Santorum, who is just kind of a, you know, run-of-the-mill, big government, um, you know, compassionate conservative, you know, circa George Bush 2004, um, is the last guy standing. Um, and, and he's going to be hard for uh, Romney to attack because he is, uh, you know, unlike Newt, who is just so obviously hypocritical about, about moral issues, right? You know, running around saying how we need to... Uh, uh, you know, preach morality um, so that the, the poor are able to, to live better and have more structured lives. You know, this coming from a man who had, who's had three marriages already. Whereas, you know, Santorum's not going to, you know, you can't knock him for that. You know, he's got, you know, a large family. He's a, he's a faithful Catholic. He's an earnest guy. Um, he's not obviously a, a huckster like, like Newt. Um, so he's, he's really just kind of, um, you know, survived by just being a kind of run-of-the-mill guy. And, uh, it, you know, Romney can't really attack him from, he can't attack him from, you know, the left, or I can't attack him from the right on social issues because, you know, there's no one more to the right on social issues than Santorum. And, uh, you know, Romney has plenty of his own um, problems on the economic side uh, on the left, you know, uh, Romney care. Um, last week he was talking about uh, indexing the minimum wage to inflation, which of course is... Uh, conservatives don't like. Um, so there's not a lot of menu of options for Romney to attack Santorum on. Yeah, I'm interested to see how things turn out with Michigan and Super Tuesday because you're, you're definitely right. Uh, Romney's going to have a hard time attacking Santorum. And another big thing is I've definitely been in the Romney is inevitable camp for a long time since the fall. A oh, Romney what camp? Romney is oh, inevitable, okay. and that like through all the ups and downs, it, it just seemed that Romney was going to win. And I, I still am leaning, like I still think that Romney is going to come out um, victorious. I think for the nomination, but Santorum, there, there's definitely a a path where Santorum could win the nomination. And looking towards the general election too, it's it's interesting to think of how things would play out with Romney versus Santorum because uh, where where the swing states are, are are kind of places where Santorum where where people like Santorum um, and it's just it's an interesting to game that out. I think there was a piece today. Uh, I don't remember where it was. Maybe maybe it was a Che piece kind of trying to game that out. And look at it, it. No, it was Frank Rich, and he was saying that this the general election is going to be not fought out in Democratic um, in blue enclaves. He called it, um, and you kind of you need to appeal to the moderates or the center right or further to win the election. And Rick Santorum would do very well there, which is kind of frightening. <laughs> I mean, if you look at some of the, the states that he might put in play, Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, you know, you, you could say he, he might be a better general election candidate. But, uh, I mean, first of all, I think that if Romney loses in Michigan, that uh, that's going to be uh, a huge, huge sign that, that he might not get the nomination. Um, mm -hmm. The first real one that we've... Well, no, had. I would say the first one. I, I would say there's been a whole bunch of signs that he just is not catching well, on. The definitive, perhaps. Uh, the definitive, you can't argue Right, but, you know, so much of uh, Romney's loyalty uh, among the party um, that is there, uh, 
is from the fact that he is the you know inevitable establishment front runner. Um, and the more that slips, um, you know, it could unravel really fast. Uh, you know, he could be the prohibitive inevitable front runner right up until he's not. And then when he's not, there's going to be a lot of people who who are not you know true Romney believers who do not you know, have no you know ideologically attached attachment to him. Um, are going to start, you know, uh, running off the ship. And, um, uh, you know, he may just be able to stop uh, raising money. I mean, right now he's able to, you know, hugely outspend Santorum um, in all these states. And, and that's been his biggest advantage so far, is, is just being to outmuscle uh, uh, Santorum or, uh, organization-wise and money-wise. But, mm -hmm. you know, as soon as that um, vision, that as soon as that idea that he's inevitable runs out, that, that money could dry up. You know, those volunteers, um, those people that want to get administration jobs might all of a sudden say, you know, Romney's not the best bet. Romney's not my, you know, ticket to um, uh, wealth in, in Washington. Um, and at that point, you know, his, his support could dry up really, really quickly. Well, I think it's been an interesting change in tone for Romney in the past weeks or so, where it definitely was his major talking point where I'm the most electable candidate, um, look at my resume, this is why you should vote for me. But partly influenced by CPAC, but kind of extending beyond that, he's been really running on, I'm the most conservative candidate, choose me because... And he's, been, he's trying to invade the territory that uh, Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum have been trying to co-opt. And the fact that he's moving onto that playing ground is kind of... It's, it's, not not a good place for him to be. Well, he's not. I mean, he's not really going to have a substantive case for it, right? I mean, what what is he, he what is he pointing it. to to say, you know, this is what makes me more conservative than Rick Santorum? You know, he has nothing. He has nothing. So it's, he has it's nothing. Odd. It's such an odd thing to run on, and yeah, it, it's a, the last thing he has. And he had a line in his CPAC uh, speech where he said, "the the easy part is getting elected," and it's like, what are, what are you saying? That's 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 the only thing you you have going for you. Don't don't. Go out, don't try to throw that away, because without it, you're just running on the same playing field on, with San Torm, and you're going to lose it. Um, but it, it, even beyond Michigan, too, it'll be interesting to see who wins what in Super Tuesday, because there's definitely been a regional divide to who's been winning things, where Gingrich got South Carolina, he's probably going to do well in some of the other southern states for Super Tuesday. Uh, Romney's been doing well in the Northeast and types of places with those kind of demographics and Ron, uh, Santorum's been the Midwest guy. And if any of them can break the pattern, um, it'll have an interesting, maybe it'll prove a trend for the rest of the primary too. Right. Well, you know, Romney was able to win Nevada, and everyone expected Romney to do to do better in the western states, but then he didn't in in Colorado. Yeah. Um, so you know, Michigan is going to be a big test for him because this this is you know he, he doesn't have the excuse that he did in Minnesota, Missouri, and Colorado that he didn't spend the resources. Everybody knows he's spending the resources this time. So if he goes all out and you know throws you know five million, ten million dollars on the air in Michigan and and comes up empty. Um, you know that it'll be it'll be the emperor has no clothes. It'll be you know mint through his whole infrastructure at it at, at the state and at, at Santorum, and he lost. And at that point, he's just he's just no longer inevitable. And I, I think you're going to see a whole lot of support um, peeling away from him pretty quickly. And I think you're going to see a whole bunch of Republicans freaking out in, in Washington because no one thinks uh, Santorum can uh, can win. Yeah, and I think uh, Nate Silver had a post today with his forecast for Michigan. Uh, has Santorum with a 77% chance of winning in Michigan, but that doesn't account for restore our future ad money or other money that uh, Romney will spend. But still, 77% is kind of definitive. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll close on that. Is that your prediction? You're predicting a Mitt Romney loss in uh, Michigan on... Uh I don't know if I'd go that far. There, there's still a lot that could change because when you had Florida, it, it was amazing how much putting $14 million in state. Okay, so, but I'm going to press you anyways. I'm going to press you anyways. You have to pick one. Does Romney win or lose Michigan? Um, 
Right now, I, I think Santorum could actually win in Michigan. Okay, so thank you, Janie. We'll uh, come back to you uh, later, and we'll see if your prediction of uh, Santorum winning in Michigan panned out. Oh, no. On the spotlight, but <laughs> we'll okay, see. Okay, thanks a lot for talking with us, Jamie. Okay, Thank bye. you. I had fun.